We face, though, now a very different global outlook. You've lived under communism and you've modestly said you, you don't follow closely what's happening in China at the moment. But I'd just be very interested in your views on how we understand China, because as we drift towards an acceptance of authoritarianism, Chinese people don't have much choice. China has increased its defence spending. This is very real for us in Australia by 800 per cent since the mid 90s. As I understand it, uh, you know they, they really now have a massive military. They're threatening Taiwan. Uh, they're behaving in a, in a way that is reminiscent of uh, past authoritarian regimes that have turned out to be very dangerous indeed. But here's the rub: for the fortune that they spend on defence, second only to the states, and more than what the whole of the rest of Asia spends on defence, they spend even more surveying uh, and monitoring, watching, controlling their own people. Now, you've lived in a communist regime. Uh, the Chinese leadership describes China as a communist country with Chinese characteristics or communism with Chinese characteristics. How, we, we don't seem to understand our own culture anymore. We've broken down our understanding of major political philosophies. I can't help thinking that one of the great mistakes we've made is that we've misunderstood that a communist is a communist is a communist and power is all important. Uh, and they always, if you like, are fearful of the loss of power and control, not only from external dangers uh, or what have you, but also from their own people. How can we understand, as you see it, the nature of these authoritarian regimes that loosely go under the banner of communism that we thought, we thought they'd lost out after the Berlin Wall you thought, collapsed? You thought that. I, the, the thing is that, if you haven't had a Marxist Leninist training, you're completely at sea and all this stuff anyway. And I have had one of those. Uh, and one of the things that you have to understand is the huge alteration in in Marxist politics, which took place in and after 1968, with both the, the May events in Paris that year and the crushing of the Prague Spring in Czechoslovakia in the same year. This is a huge moment of change when large numbers of people on the left, both in the West and in the East, decided that the Soviet experiment had come to an end effectively and couldn't be continued, certainly couldn't be applied in Western Europe and any, any advanced country. The ideas of Antonio Gramsci, who began to formulate this in the 1920s, uh, began to come to the fore among left-wingers that the, the, crucial, uh, the crucial area of, of, of left-wing advance was no longer to try and seize control of the economy or even the state machine, but to seize control of the culture. And, and this, and, and so that this this began. Of course, it, it, this this is paralleled in China with the understanding of people such as Deng Xiaoping that it didn't matter that the, the power of the Communist Party would not be reduced if they allowed capitalism to flourish. Uh, when he said to get rich is glorious, it was a it was a moment of understanding. And what the 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 left, both in the East and the West, have, have returned to very much is revolutionary politics way before the Russian Revolution. They, they're going back to the, the original fountain of it all, the French Revolution, um, the, the, the 1789, and particularly 1793, and also the other thing which, which Karl Marx was full of admiration for, the Paris Commune of 1871. Not really much to do uh, with economic measures, not really much to do with, uh, with, with the seizure of the, of the economy, much more to do with the transformation of the culture, much more to do with the overthrow and crushing of religion, particularly the Christian religion, uh, which you will have noticed has been facing a great deal more persecution in China since she took over than it did before. So there is some parallel in this between the two. The other thing about China, I spent a lot of time visiting China in the first decade of the century. And I, it's a planet, not a country. It's enormous. And you can see that they, they're terribly worried in Peking about how to control this country, which are huge causes of discontent, particularly in rural areas. And they are terrified of China disorder, uh, with very good reason, because you look back over the 20th century history of China, so the, the, the country which tore itself to pieces and uh, basically allowed, the, particularly the Japanese, to, 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 to charge around all over the country without anybody to, to push them out. But they never want that, that again. So they, they are terrified of internal dissent. Also, the Taiwan issue. I think they believe that if they can, if, if, if they can increase their, their their military power in certain ways and areas to a, to a particular extent, that eventually the United States and Japan will recognize 
because the, the Taiwan is indefensible and will have to, in the end, be uh, ushered back into the People's Republic, which is their intention. They don't want to fight over it, but what they do want to do is to create a, a, a type and level of military strength which would cause the United States a huge amount of trouble and expense to, to, to challenge, and therefore to create the atmosphere in which Taiwan itself will eventually recognize that that's where its fate lies, and Japan will understand that if it's going to carry on having an alliance with the United States, it's going to cost it. That would be my guess about what Chinese foreign policy is. Uh, so uh, these things are not surprising, and they've become rich enough, which they weren't really before the big bugs have been changed, they've become rich enough to indulge in this level uh, of, of, of defense spending, and, and they're, they're doing it, and you know, they are resentful of the way in which they were treated by outside powers in the 19th century particularly, and resentful of the way in which they were virtually a, a corpse in the 20th century, they don't want that to happen again. I can't blame them for that. I don't think any of us can. I, and they're proud of being Chinese. Why shouldn't they be? But th these are th these are different aspects from the, the nature of the internal regime, which is, is still the Communist Party, uh, which still believes very strongly that the, the, the government is so, uh, is, is so endowed uh, with a, a good understanding of the world and the best interests of China that it, 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 it must have desires and must be given supreme power and authority in all matters. And this is, uh, this, this is obviously frightening to, to close neighbors and to the world in general, especially if China does manage to maintain its economic growth and maintain its internal power to the extent that it, it does eventually challenge the United States and become the supreme global power. Of course, it's very worrying, uh, but I'm not quite sure what you can do about it. But the other thing is that the parallel uh, events in, in Western Europe and the United States, where the left has shifted its trajectory away from economic power, seizing the barracks and the police station, to seizing the school and the television studio and the, and, and the, and, and the, and the cinema and the university and the newspaper, uh, and, and, and altering morality and, and driving out the remaining precepts of Christianity. The world is going through an extraordinary revolutionary convulsion at the moment, and much of it, because it's not actually violent, goes past people, because they, they expect revolutions to, to look like uh, an Eisenstein film or, 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 or something out of Charles Dickens. They, 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 they expect to see bayonets and people being strung up on lampposts and guillotines and firing squads. None of that happens. It's the Kierkegaardian revolution where everything remains standing, but the world becomes totally different. That's what I believe we're going through. Well, as always, Peter, you really help us understand what is happening with clarity of mind and great experience. And, and I'm deeply appreciative. Perhaps one final thought or one final question. Um, it's often said that authoritarian regimes always fail sooner or later. The people rise up, they demand something better. But there's a difference this time around as I see it. Uh, I'm one of those people who believes that human nature doesn't change, that generally speaking, history rhymes, the lessons can be learned. What's different about China this time is that that massive amount of money they spend on controlling their own people is able to deploy technology that is truly frightening in its reach into our everyday lives. They really can monitor virtually everything and the social credit scheme based on you know you jaywalk across the street and you lose a couple of points you criticize the communist point you might lose party you might lose so many points you can't get a job or you can't get married or you can't get the internet um, that level of control is something that i would argue we've never seen before it's true I and mean, it's, it's it's actually it's the state replacing god uh, and replacing conscience uh, replacing conscience with, with electronics you know what you're doing uh, you can't hide anything from us. Uh, we'll reward you if you're good in our terms, and we'll punish you if you're not. So this is this is George Orwell's 1984 come to full reality. And if they can succeed in doing it, they will have measures of control that no one's ever seen before. Doesn't mean I, mean, I don't know. I can't. Who can who can tell the future? It doesn't mean that China couldn't, at some stage, uh, fall victim again to internal. Uh, Descent and, uh, and, and control. But this is an immensely old civilization. I uh, remember that as well. It's, it's been there for a very, very long time and it's very big. And for a change, it's very rich. And for a change in its, in its recent history, it's very powerful. And I, it, might, it might be quite lasting. Uh, and we may have to come to, a, to an accommodation with it. And certainly, sure, 
a lot of Western governments have been heavily influenced by Chinese attitudes towards how to deal with, uh, with the coronavirus.